next stop is my talk. Um, so I, I've been asked to talk about transversus abdominis release, uh, primarily technical tips. Again, I'm Andrew Duffy from uh, Yale and New Haven. Uh, just one disclosure, not relevant uh, to this talk, a consultant for Lexington, Me Lexington Medical. I'm hoping to go through some uh, basics about preoperative consideration and discuss strategies for mitigating risk factors, which we all know are uh, ever present in our hernia population. I'm going to go through some of the technical details of the TAR uh, that hopefully the following talks can, can build on and talk about some of the technical tips that may help facilitate good outcomes. I mean, the goals of hernia repair with abdominal wall reconstruction in particular are, th are to, to develop a durable repair of the hernia defect. That means minimizing recurrence. But we also, particularly with abdominal wall reconstruction, are looking to improve or restore abdominal function for what was taken away from the previous incision in hernia. Uh, these are primarily tissue repairs. They're mesh reinforced. We generally try and avoid bridging of the mesh material. And some of the other goals, obviously, to minimize pain and disability, both immediately, post-operatively, and for long term. Uh, and of course, minimizing post-operative wound complications and infections, which is always the bane, particularly when you're placing synthetic materials. I think pre-op imaging is very important, and I think I share a patient population with Dr. Hope, and most of my patients have a BMI well in excess of 35. And like this uh, patient who barely fit in the CT scanner, a significant loss of domain, low suprapubic hernia, uh, there's, there's a lot of issues in how to repair this, and I think the preoperative imaging uh, combined with the exam is extremely helpful in developing a plan. And it's important to do, the, uh, I think, the right operation for the right patient at the right time. Uh, this is another uh, patient of mine who is a kidney transplant patient, and this is a recurrent hernia over the kidney transplant that ultimately I repaired with a uh, limited right-sided tar repair and then rebuilt the pelvic floor and the inguinal ligament uh, using uh, permanent mesh uh, anchored with bone anchors at the anterior superior leg spine and the pubic symphysis. Um, <clears throat> there's many risk factors which can affect both the occurrence of the original hernia and the potential recurrence and affect uh, healing and infection risks. We know most of them, obesity, smoking, diabetes, uh, prior mesh infection, drug resistant status is obviously going to affect it. Whether or not there's a stoma, we're going to hear about that later. Is there a radiation history that's going to affect healing? And are these patients, like my transplant patient, are they immunosuppressed? Are they on specific medications or drugs that could affect the ability to heal? And how do you work around that? And how do you time that? Uh, I think these things all need to be considered in elective and semi elective hernia repairs. Uh, I'm also a bariatric surgeon. Uh, this is very helpful in our hernia practice. I have a number of patients who We've done bariatric surgery on first, then fix the hernia, even if they came to us for the hernia for it makes a big difference. This patient, six months later, lost 10 points off the BMI, ultimately had a um, retroactive repair and did well. There's always special cases. Uh, this is a, a, a smoker, very high BMI, unfortunately didn't have bariatric coverage, so my other strategy was out and had a chronic mesh infection from a, uh, a attempted laparoscopic umbilical hernia repair. Um, he did stop smoking. He lost 50 pounds pre-op. He lost another 55 pounds at the time of surgery and uh, ended up having a uh, uh, limited retroactive repair with a uh, synthetic uh, absorbable material. I'm, I'm taking suggestions on this one. I haven't operated on this patient yet. Uh, this is a five-time recurrent hernia on a patient who had an open gastric bypass about 20 years ago. Initially, it's synthetic mesh bridging, ultimately had an anterior component separation with a biologic mesh, had a wound problem, got skin grafted, and, and still has recurring skin ulceration. Uh, there's not much left to optimize. You lost some weight already. Uh, this is probably going to end up being a variation of a, of a tar after an anterior component separation uh, with the help of a plastic surgeon. There's many different repair options, uh, different positions for the mesh. Uh, we're going to hear more about anterior component separation a little bit later. You know, a lot of us have probably seen this slide before. Going back to 1990 with Ramirez, a lot of different descriptions about the different planes that can be separated to try and obtain uh, release and tissue closure uh, with or without mesh. Uh, Nowitzki first uh, brought up the transverse abdominis release back in 2009 in the American Heart Society. Uh, this article was published in uh, 2012. And this, 
takes uh, advantage of the anatomy of the transverse abdominis muscle and its accessibility through the posterior lamella of the uh, rectus sheath, allowing us to release the muscles that are most perpendicular to midline uh, hernias. Um, most of these slides here are taken from uh, Dr. Nowitzki's uh, uh, book, and this, this shows after performing a laparotomy and lysing adhesions, taking down the hernia sac of incising the medial edge of the rect posterior rectus sheath to enter the retrorectus space. Developing that plane out laterally, and you can see on the, on the picture here, the uh, lateral per uh, uh, neurovascular perforator uh, bundles are, are, are visible, which is the lateral aspect of the dissection. The posterior lamella of the internal oblique uh, fascia can be released at this point, exposing particularly uh, up high closer to the ribs. You can see the transverse abdominis uh, muscle in this layer and, and start to, to release that and then moving uh, further, uh, you, you can uh, release the uh, internal oblique, uh, excuse me, the transverse abdominis uh, aponeurosis. This is a picture of the release of the transverse uh, abdominis uh, or a clamp with the rectus muscle retracted uh, superiorly. This, this incision is typically made about a millimeter, excuse me, a centimeter uh, medial to where the perforators are to preserve the innervation and vascular supply up to the rectus muscle. You can develop this retral muscular plane, uh, preferably staying anterior to the transverse abdominis, uh, uh, although sometimes this is just a true preperitoneal plane. And you can get a significant release as shown in this picture. You get about, uh, you know, about doubles the release you're going to get from the retrorectus uh, release. You can see the rectus muscle retracted uh, off to the side. You see significant medial advancement with the exposed transversalis uh, uh, fascia and the, and the incised edge of the transverse abdominis muscle. Superiorly, where the linea alba splits around the uh, the subxiphoid uh, fat pad, you can carry this all the way up towards the, uh, the central tendon of, of the diaphragm, give excellent exposure, and then you can bring those two edges of the posterior sheath back together as part of the uh, posterior closure. The uh, xiphoid, by the way, makes an excellent anchoring point uh, for, for, the, for the mesh. This posterior layer uh, then be closed in, a, in a, usually a running suture. I like to uh, use a locking suture or tie this uh, as I go to maintain tension on this. When you get below, particularly when you get below the arcuate line, uh, this tissue gets a lot, a lot thinner. And occasionally there's issues with being able to get the uh, posterior layers completely closed. A technique that I've used in the past is to actually use the hernia sac, which I usually excise early on, and use that to patch the, that area, uh, although biologic material can be used uh, also. In, a biologic mesh in that setting. The mesh can then be placed in the sublay position, anterior to the now closed uh, posterior fascia. Uh, this, this diagram shows uh, uh, lateral anchoring sutures placed uh, trans transabdominally. I'm getting away from using many of those, uh, preferring to go with more fixed anchoring points like uh, down in, in the pelvis. Um, to the uh, Cooper's leg and pubic symphysis and up at the xiphoid, like I mentioned earlier. Different configurations of being able to put the mesh in. Um, typically, I'll use a medium weight uh, polypropylene or macroporous mesh. This mesh, the most standard size is 30 by 30 centimeters. It can be oriented in different ways to, uh, to fit into this area. There is a 30 by 45 centimeter mesh uh, also available. With the mesh in place and the anterior fascia, uh, edges can be cleared of the remaining hernia sac. This is usually a good time to remove any excess uh, soft tissue as part of the closure, minimize the amount of skin flaps left over with uh, uh, running closure anteriorly. And my preference actually is to do some particular closure and not use staples uh, in this area, and I'm very selectively draining the spaces. And Nowitzki's uh, published a paper uh, last year looking at surgical site events, which is always the biggest concern with these repairs, seeing about almost 20% of the surgical site events, about half of those that were infections, with about 2.6% of, of the patients out of the 420 patients in the study actually had deep surgical site infections, which included the mesh. Interestingly, in this paper, they did not have to excise any of the meshes. They did debris several of them, but most of these were managed uh, with, without uh, excision. Uh, 
So my, my approach, and we're still collating our own, own data on this, but I'm still a minimally invasive surgeon, although I'm doing these big operations through big incision, I still try to minimize the wound side, size and minimize uh, flap and length of incision wherever possible. This can make some, for some interesting retraction. Um, we try to excise as much redundant soft tissue as possible, minimizing flaps, dead space, judicious use of the cautery to avoid leaving the necrotic tissue behind on the edges of the where we're hoping to heal. Minimize the mesh handling. I don't typically bring the mesh up until we're ready for it with a change of gloves over on the field. We'll irrigate the layers. Does it help? I don't know. Um, limit the transfascial sutures and, and, like I said, selective placement of the drains. A few questions that come up is can anterior and posterior tar uh, component separations would be performed at the same time. It's probably unwise to do it at the same time. You can usually get extra release with posterior tar and anterior is not going to add much other than to weaken the abdominal muscle down so you only have the internal oblique layer left behind. This, this could probably be done later on though. And Dr. Pauly uh, published a paper on this and we'll hear from him later. Uh, give enough time with the, the, my patient with the anterior components has failed, that, that retrorectus and uh, tar plane may be uh, available and be usable. In conclusion, I think open tar is a well-designed study technique for abdominal wall reconstruction in primary and recurrent large ventral hernias. It does provide an excellent functional repair in most cases and certainly provides improved abdominal wall cosmesis, uh, particularly in some of those patients I showed you earlier. One of the questions is, can we minimize these wound complications? Like I said, I'm an MIS surgeon, which in this case stands for maximally invasive surgery. And I'd really like to know what the role of minimally invasive approaches can be. And we'll invite Dr. Belyansky to come up now and so he can show us how it's all done laparoscopically. <laughs> 